8. Mark chapter 8, verses 27 through 38. Listen for the word of the living God as we read these words. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? And they answered him, John the Baptist, and others, Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, but who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, you are the Messiah. And he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all of this quite openly. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at all his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Follow behind me, you adversary. For you are setting your mind not on godly things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy messengers. The living God still speaks today. Thanks be to God. There are lots of people vowing to speak for God. That's nothing new. We've had false prophets since the time of Elijah, Micaiah, Isaiah, even before the time of Moses. Not all of them claim to speak for Yahweh. But it should not be surprising at all that most of the voices making the loudest claims to being the sole owners of God's truth, might as well be speaking for anyone other than Jesus. That even applies to a host of people who claim Jesus' name. Jesus' own disciples had trouble keeping up with what Jesus was teaching them. They had a hard time setting aside their assumptions about God to embrace Jesus as he was. Whom do we allow to define God? Are we set on pushing God into the boxes of human making? I can't speak for you. But I kind of like to be known. I don't mean famous. I don't want people to know, or I want people to know who I am rather than picturing me as someone and something I am not. I don't care for people making assumptions about me that are completely unfounded. I don't like them having expectations for me that do not fit the reality of who I am, what I'm capable of, 
how I navigate the world that we share. I want people to see me and understand who I am, rather than placing me in some sort of box they have designed that will never fit me comfortably. We find Jesus in today's passage of Mark, there are a host of expectations and competing ideas about his identity, his role, his purpose. That has been apparent for some time now in his ministry. Herod had developed the notion that Jesus was John the Baptist who had returned from being beheaded, he was alive and kicking again. The crowds he had fed on two occasions now rather much wanted him to become political leader of Israel. People within and even beyond Israel looked on Jesus as a miracle worker, a healer. They looked on him as a prophet. All their differing notions of Jesus' identity competed for space with each other. They were trying to make sense out of what they were seeing in Jesus. And none of them had quite figured it out. Jesus asked the twelve about his reputation in the larger community. He asked what was being said about him. They gave him all the answers we just mentioned above. There's no consensus among the crowds. They figured Jesus was special, but they did not really know what to do with him. They could not decide which box to place Jesus in. Then Jesus asked the disciples who they understood Jesus to be. And as always, Peter is the one quick on the draw. You are the anointed, the Messiah, the one we have been awaiting, the Christ. Well done, Peter. Then Jesus told them to keep that quiet. Does that strike you as odd? It probably should. Here we find Peter getting the right answer for once. And Jesus tells him, be quiet, sit down. Jesus did not shut him down because the words were wrong. He shut him down because he did not understand the words he was using. Peter did not understand Messiah the same way that Jesus defined and applied the word to himself. This is one of those terms that is rather more generic than we might understand it to be in its origin. But it's also one of those words that we attribute a lot of special meaning to. Some meanings that it may or may not have actually had for Jesus. It was the same thing in the first century. Messiah or Christ refers to an anointing. That could be by a king, by a deity. God was known to appoint, anoint prophets, priests, kings. Any kind of emissary could be anointed. It's rather like our term commission. You can commission people for all kinds of things, can't you? We commission people to prepare works of art, to perform a special investigation. When Peter uses the term for Jesus, perhaps it should be no surprise that Jesus did not want it thrown around haphazardly. He wanted to be the one to define it, to define how it applied to him. The commission Jesus was under did not fit the popular expectations associated with the term. 
He was not there to become a military general. He was on no mission to become a king after the likes of David or Saul. He was not one more priest to oversee the sacrifices and offerings in the temple. He was not one more prophet. One more voice calling people to recognize the injustices to which they were party, calling them to renew their dedication to Yahweh. He did not belong to any of those categories with which they were familiar. He may have been God's anointed, God's Christ, God's Messiah, but as such, his role did not fit any of the standard expectations that they tied to this term. John the Baptist's disciples had come asking about whether he was the one that they were awaiting. They were sent back to John, you'll remember, to report what they had seen, that Jesus was healing, feeding, preaching good news to the vulnerable. Well, I mean, that was all fine and good, but it did not match up with what John was focused on. We find Jesus explaining what it meant for him to be Messiah, but the disciples had the same difficulty that John had had distancing themselves from their received traditions about Messiah. As much as Jesus talked to them about suffering, rejection, death, and resurrection, that was beyond them. It just did not fit with any of the boxes that they had for Messiah. Neither prophet nor priest nor king, nor special envoy of God was supposed to be killed. How could you have God's brand new inaugural messianic reign and kill the king before it got started? Peter pulled Jesus aside to correct him in private, allowing him to, you know, save face. Jesus had just spoken openly of his impending death and suffering, and Peter felt the need to correct him. Messiah could not die. There was no paradigm for accepting Messiah's death. There was no box to contain such a disturbing idea. Death was defeat. Death was loss. Death was the end. And they were looking for Jesus to usher in a new beginning, a new reality. They were anticipating God's new reign on earth. Isn't that what Jesus had been teaching and preaching about? God's reign is life. To what shall I compare God's reign? Thy reign come, thy will be done on earth. God's reign has come near. It is better to enter God's reign. God's reign for them was a present or impending earthly reality. Jesus had been inviting people to actively enter God's reign, to allow God to rule in their lives, to place their lives under God's care, provision, and direction. Despite the political realities of Roman oppression and occupation. John's gospel makes it pretty clear that when Jesus spoke to them of a place in God's presence, Beyond death, they had nothing upon which to pin that concept. It was new. It was beyond them. 
going to heaven upon death was not part of their vocabulary. In order for Messiah to have any role in their understanding of God's reign, Messiah's death simply could not be in the cards. Peter was sure that either they had all misunderstood Jesus or maybe he had somehow gotten confused. Heat stroke? Sunstroke? Something bad to drink or eat? He was playing the role of campaign advisor, getting Jesus back on message. Jesus was not having it. He was not about to let Peter or anyone else define who he was under the title of Messiah, Christ, or anointed. Their understanding and definitions were simply inadequate. They neither embraced an earthly reality in which Jesus need not be physically present, nor did they extend beyond the limits of death. They were too wrapped up in political realities, in warring among nations, in violent overthrow, in oppression. They were more about wielding power over others. None of that rose to meet who Jesus understood himself to be. None of it bowed to God's will of love, grace, and justice. Jesus could neither accept Peter's private redirection, nor could he leave the crowds with the same misunderstandings. God's reign begins in the now. It's not something we simply await. It is a reality we live under the rule and influence of God right now. It's not about gaining the trappings of political power. It's about embracing the way of God, the way of love, the way of grace. Does that fit in the boxes that we hang on to? Or are we still pressing God into something that doesn't fit? 